Who are you people? I am the doctor, and this is it's my... It's complicated, um, actually. I am also... My nurse. Excuse me? I realize that seems a little improbable. Well, yes. Because he's a man. What? Older gentlemen, like women, can be put to oh, use. You can't, you, can't, you, you can't say things like that. Can't I? Says who? Just about everyone you want to meet for the rest of your life here. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cloisterbell podcast. I'm Rob. And I'm Liam. And this week we're going back to talking about multi-doctor stories. And we're talking about Twice Upon a Time. Yeah, and in terms of um, the retrospectives that we've been doing, this is the most recent, uh, broadcast on the 25th of December 2017. And we're quite fortunate we got David Bradley back as the Doctor. Mm Mm-hmm. It was pretty pretty last minute, wasn't it? <laughs> I feel like um, after the Moffat era, it was unlikely to happen. No, no, that's true, and um, and it was only four years after the the fiftieth anniversary, which mm. um, where we saw Adventures in Time and Space, which was a docu drama looking at the very beginnings of Doctor Who, and David Bradley played William Hartnell. Mm-hmm. Um, so you saw David Bradley play William Hartnell then him playing William Hartnell playing the Doctor and that was a, a really good performance which took everyone by surprise so I think fr- from the off people were saying well there's an opportunity here we can get David Bradley in yeah it feels like a more legitimate um, excuse to bring him into it now mm. if they if they just brought, it, brought in David Bradley had he not been in the documentary drama um, it might have um caused more of an uproar possibly possibly but then i think uh i don't think it would have actually cost crossed anybody's mind to do that i no. think it was because of the success of adventures in time and space not just in terms of david Bradley's performance i mean the whole thing was very well received uh i think that probably sowed the seeds of going right this is a you know this is a possibility and of course there'd already been a prescient set of the first doctor being recast in 1983's the five doctors um, with Richard Hurnell playing the first Doctor, so th- there was already that. But I think, I think it was the fact that Adventures in Time and Space had had been made and been broadcast. That's what sowed the seeds. Otherwise, mm. I mean, we don't know. But otherwise, I don't think um, the thought would have crossed anyone's mind, really. No, no. Um, I know a lot of people were hoping for maybe some classic episodes remade. But he, I suppose he's doing big finish now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it's sort of funny um, that there seems to be, with what you've just said, there seems to be this desire to to reshoot um, old television programmes that may have been lost. Dad's Army um, has sort of really done that in a big way, uh, which has proved quite interesting and been quite well received. Um, because there's, there's episodes of Dad's Army which are missing. And... They've, but they've got the original script, so they've just been reshooting those. And then we've got some students, uh, which we mentioned in the previous podcast, who have reshot Mission to the Unknown. Mm-hmm. Which the, um, the update on that at the moment is that they've finished filming it, then they're now in post production. That's excellent. But still, no word on how that'll be distributed. Uh, no, not yet. I suspect that we'll probably get some news quite soon. And I think, um, judging from reactions on Twitter, the news coverage it's been getting and the fact it's been looked at in um, the recent Doctor Who magazine, issue 536, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in there. So I think I think we'll probably get an update very soon on that. Yeah. It might not be like a physical release straight away. With the nature of how it was made, mm-hmm. it could be lined up for maybe a film festival or something like that. Yeah, that sounds quite likely. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Shown mm. at a, f- a film festival or two, and then before they distribute in a in a much wider way. 
They may even yeah. just they may even just show it on YouTube or something. Who knows? Possibly, yeah, mm. yeah. So, have you got any news this week? I know we've had the cover up for the Macro Terra. Well, yes, I was just about to say that. So that's due, uh, at the time of recording. That's just due out uh, to be released quite soon. By the time you're listening to this, it's probably already out. Um, there's there's two forms of it you, because there's a, a limited edition steelbook version. And the artwork of that I really rather like, which is of the TARDIS in a cave with the shadow of a um, uh, of the macra behind it, which looks quite nice. And I yeah. like the the color scheme on that. the The main cover for the standard release, though, um, I mean, I don't know what you think. It's all uh, right. It's a bit. It's a bit garish. I mean, I don't want to decry the the, the hard work of that someone's done, but. I th- Personally speaking, I think it could have been a better job done. Um, I knew it would have the new series logo because of all the um, extensive rebranding they've been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, and I don't mind that. And in fact, because I I really love the um, I love the new logo. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's been proven that the rebranding that's been taking place, every, everything Doctor Who related, has had that on and. It, it really allow one it's it's a great logo and it looks good but i think it allow it allows other artwork to to develop in its own way um so it doesn't compete and it sort of gels really nice there's um we've had a vinyl release of the soundtrack for the daleks master plan and there's some more around the corner for destiny of the daleks and galaxy 4 yeah um so any vinyl fans out there keep an eye on those uh, i think they're due to come out on on Saturday the thirteenth of April, which is a uh, record store day, uh, okay. and I've I've seen the art cover for those, and they're really rather nice. Um, nice use of colour. There's a lot of purples and oranges in the Galaxy Four, and different shades of blue for Destiny of the Daleks, with the new Doctor Who logo. But um, and it all looks really rather nice. Although um, frustratingly, the season eighteen Blu-ray box set has been delayed once again. Oh, okay. So I think that's the third or fourth delay. Um, at the time of recording, I was supposed to get, it was supposed to come tomorrow, which was Monday the eleventh. Which is oh. it's it's now scheduled for the eighteenth, which is the week after. Mm. Um, you know, it's fine. I, it actually does my back it does my bank uh, account uh, balance uh, a lot better actually. <laughs> so it's uh, I'm not too bothered actually. You know, to, but mm. it's been interesting that of. Of the three box sets, including this one, none of them have come out on time. No. And was there any disc replacements for any of them? There was for the Season 12 box set. Um, Revenge, the initial one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The There were some not, not major issues to prevent um, enjoyment of watching the stories. It was just a few things. But there were, there were replacement discs for the Suntoran Experiment and Revenge of the Cybermen. Uh, I think that's it because with the season 18 box set uh, there wasn't any issues the only one was one of the special features on the Castrovalva disc for the con- uh, for the continuity the sound goes out of sync oh really but because it's not regarded as a major special feature on the disc I don't think there's been any talk of replacing that no I'd expect not no and I think um, because of the, the slight teething problems uh, with the previous ones, the fact that this has been delayed again, I think everyone just you know, just making sure that by the time we get it, it's the best possible product there is, and you know, no hopefully, one to, yeah, yeah, and no one has to faff on with replacement discs. I mean, <laughs> yeah. when we do eventually get them, there's a lot of hard work and love that's gone into them, and I mean, I really appreciate them. I think I think they're great, and it's 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 just the just the uh, anticipation building up because I know that yeah. I want to re- I mean Logopolis I think is a great um, is a great story I really really like that um, and the original production the, the, the special effects um, were the best that they could achieve and it's absolutely fine I can forgive that but um, we've seen some t- teaser footage of some of the special features that they've done and just to improve the look of the story and it's just oh, it looks absolutely fantastic because they actually they've actually gone to Jodrell Bank and filmed some footage so you can uh, have the option to watch that new footage inserted into Logopolis just to sell the shots oh brilliant yeah and that's really cool yeah, yeah. 
I still haven't got around to buying ordering any of the classic Blu-rays yet. <laughs> I feel like if I if I did start, I'd be all in. So it's a hard hard decision to make. No, no, that's perfectly fine because uh, I mean, as soon as I made the decision to buy season twelve, I knew I was in. So it's just like, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be buying them all. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what's I think I'm good? Do I buy them or not? But yeah, I, I'm all in. <laughs> yeah, you just know the last one will come out. Um, in the era of the next Doctor, when they've rebranded the show, <laughs> there'll be a crappy new logo there. <laughs> but better bloody not. Um, in that in that sense, I'm pleased that there's uh, there's a bit of a gap before we get to Jodie Whittaker's next season. So hopefully yeah. there'll be a bit of a gap, so so, so, so everything aligns up properly and it yeah. looks nice. Yeah, it's good to know we're definitely getting another series with her. Um, because of course there was a, a question of whether Chibnall and Jodie were leaving. Yeah, that was a peculiar rumor that yeah. got started. I mean, this early yeah. on, it was just like, what? Surely not. I mean, with all the all the backlash that series got from the fans, I was thinking maybe they're going to vote for a, um, have a vote of no confidence in Chibnall's favour because, <laughs> I don't know, no yeah. one was really happy with it. Well, no, I mean, I think... Um... I think the, the 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 massive negativity was just from a handful of like just a handful of fans. It wasn't it wasn't the main. No, uh, of course not. No, no. It, but it's I mean, the ne- the ne- the negative ones that are usually the most vocal, which is a shame. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think uh, I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, things have settled down now, and I think for. I think the accepted consensus is that on the whole, it was quite a good series, although not perfect. Um, there were some cracking good stories in there. Rosa arguably being one of the best that the series... Uh, amongst one of the best that the series has ever done, uh, for example. I was really a really big fan of The Witchfinders. I really liked that episode. Um, but m- maybe the series was lacking a bit of, um, you know, the monster of the weak element that, that Doctor Who tends to relish in. Maybe, yeah. Um... But on the whole, I think yeah, I think the, I think most people have ignored the neg- the massive negativity because it was a bit unhinged and just from a, a vocal minority. Hopefully, I mean, next next time round, um, any of this kind of stigma about having a female doctor that certain people might have had mm-hmm. has totally been uh, been blown away now. You know, everyone will be used to having Jodie now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's one interesting thing that that's come out in the news recently because within a short space of time, Alex Kingston is that who plays? Have I got her name right? Who plays River? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Uh, Alex Kingston and Sylvester McCoy were being interviewed recently, and they happened to say that they were initially a little bit apprehensive with regards to a, a female Doctor being cast, which I thought was yeah. interesting. But but of course, what they've said is, but they. Having seen Jodie Whittaker, that those fears were quickly laid aside. That's fair enough. It's quite a radical change. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's absolutely fine. And just to, just to caveat something I said before, that isn't to say that anyone who genuinely may not like Series Eleven, that isn't to say that I'm decrying your view. Um, as long as I think it's constructive, um, and you know, that's absolutely fine. Uh, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. What 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 I was criticising was just. Um, you know, the absolute vitriol and hate that, that seemed to be a bit unhinged that some people were vocalising about. Yeah. Um, the fact, you know, it's like, how dare a woman play the Doctor when they haven't even, you know, seen the outcome. That type of thing, that's the sort of thing I was talking about. Yeah. And there's just no point in worrying. I mean, just wait another five, six, seven years. Everything will have changed. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. The, the, well, the, eventually they'll have a new TARDIS, we'll have a new Doctor, we'll have a new showrunner. Mm-hmm. Everything everything changes. So mm-hmm. just kind of embrace it and and just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was out driving today and <laughs> it's strange, I had a double take. Um, I'm sure I saw Chris Chibnall driving a bus. <laughs> <laughs> it was uncanny. I, I hope not because that might imply maybe he's lost his job. Or maybe maybe he's just doing a lot of research so he can really get the grips of uh, Bradley's character. Right. (laughs) 
perhaps. Yeah, I mean, the thing I remember uh, this was a, a few years back. I used to work for, uh, I used to work at Newcastle University, and one of the things there was when when I was at the when I was in the canteen just having my lunch, I looked over to the next table and I had to do a double take because I, I could have sworn it was Terry Pratchett sitting on the next <laughs> table, uh, but it wasn't. It was just some random nutty university professor. But that's. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, when you work in uh, establishments like that, you know, you get you get Terry Pratchett lookalikes. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. because he's passed away now, you you know, it's not going to be him. But at the time, I got, there was that moment of excitement going, oh, no! But, oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> oh, what a shame. <laughs> also, I was just looking on Twitter, and four years ago this month, we made a list of best to worst debut stories for a doctor oh yeah I've completely forgot about that yeah but first um, what do you think would be the best debut story for a doctor do you mean now or do I remember what we originally what we well what would, you, what, what would you say now at the top of my head I think I I think I'd probably go for Power of the Daleks alright okay okay and the worst <laughs> the worst um, the worst one if you can't think of it, it's probably because you've blotted it from your memory altogether. You've erased it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably an obvious choice. I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I'd probably give probably give different answers to both these questions if I give it a bit more thought. But I think what's immediately coming to mind is the twin dilemma, which is probably the obvious choice, I think, for a lot of people. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, how about you? The best and the worst? Uh, well, I'm looking at the list now, so it's hard to change my opinion. I'm kind of agreeing with it. All right. Um, I mean, because the thing is, for me, at some point, I would like us to, to go and review The Twin Dilemma, because I think there's a lot to be said for it. Um, it Whenever Doctor Who magazine does a does an issue where they're looking at um, where they get the, the viewers to rank the stories and they collate them all, The Twin Dilemma always goes at the bottom as the worst Doctor Who story. And I'm not going to suggest um, that it needs a massive reappraisal or anything like that. But I, personally speaking, I don't think it's the worst Doctor Who story ever. No. Um, but anyway, yeah, so looking at the list now. All right, okay, so in at number one, we said Spearhead from Space. Yes. I'd, funny enough, in at number two is The Power of the Daleks. And I think I'd probably swap those around just in terms of my own list. Then Interesting. Number, yeah. Uh, in at number three, Deep Breath. Mm-hmm. Number four, The Eleventh Hour. Number five, Castrovalva. Then six, An Unearthly Child. Seven, The TV Movie. Number eight, The Christmas Invasion. Nine, Time and the Rani. Which the fact that we've put this over Rose and Robot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some, some listeners will go, uh, hmm, interesting. And then in at number 12, The Twin Dilemma. Yeah. So where would you place the woman who fell to Earth? Mm. Mm, that's... Better or worse than Deep Breath? Ooh. See, I quite like Deep Breath, but I think... I think I would say higher. So we'll just put it no higher than Power of the Daleks, obviously. And No, I mean, just... I like it, but it's, it's, no, it's, <laughs> it's not better than Power of the Daleks. No. So, it's da- so it's down at number three, the all-time favourite. Well, on this list, I mean, personally <laughs> speaking, I think this list needs a bit of rejigging. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe. I mean, ele- I mean, I love Time of the Rod just because it's so immensely enjoyable. But we'll put it over Rose and Robot. I know that's just wrong. <laughs> I think we probably disagreed on this list when we made it. Yeah, I think I remember going back to. Yeah, I think we made some compromises. Well, that's Doctor Who. It's always going to end in arguments. <laughs> It is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. I remember reading something ages ago, and they were talking about um, James Bond fandom, and they mm-hmm. and the view was that James Bond fans are the best in the world in the sense that everyone recognises that there's a difference of opinion, and no one gets sort of really hemmed up about it. I thought you were going to say they're the worst, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a bit of a shame that Doctor Who fans, I think, have a reputation of being inc- very, very negative. Which I don't think mm-hmm. is the case. I think, once again, I think it's a, a vocal minority ruining it for mm-hmm. the vast majority. Yeah. I think for most fans, um, the appreciation of the show is quite healthy. I, I definitely think so, yeah. So, 
so going to um, the main, which is twice upon a time. So, if you permit me uh, the indulgence, just a, a synopsis of the episode. So, after a devastating fight with the Cybermen, the Doctor is facing another regeneration, yet is refusing to do so. And so the TARDIS deposits him in the snowy wastelands of the Antarctic to teach him something. Meanwhile, many thousands of years ago in the snowy wastelands of Antarctica, in 1986... Um, the first Doctor is struggling to find the TARDIS following a draining fight with the Cybermen and is facing his first ever regeneration. Yet is refusing to do so. Can you see the parallels? And encounters his future self, his supposed 12th incarnation. What follows is the freezing of time and a mysterious appearance of a British First World War captain who has, nearing his death, been removed from his own time and erroneously placed in the Antarctic where the first Doctor's refusal to regenerate alongside his future self has caused an error in time. The TARDIS is then stolen by a humanoid glass creature, the one responsible for removing the captain, and explains that if the captain is released back to her so he can die as history naturally dictates, the Doctor can have a friend in return, the supposedly dead Bill Potts, who then appears. Despite the Twelfth Doctor being unsure if Bill is real or a duplicate, they all escape and try to find out what the glass humanoid is all about and why she and her kind take those nearing death and steal their memories before returning them to die. The Doctor does this by finding Rusty, a Dalek, to access his database. It turns out the glass humanoids are part of Testimony, a project designed to extract people from their timelines at the moment of their death to simply archive their memories and appearance as glass avatars. Bill is one such avatar. The Doctor agrees with Testimony to return the Captain to the trenches of the First World War, but rather than dying or being killed, it is during the Christmas Truce of 1914 and so lives. Both Doctors then leave in their respective TARDISes, having decided to go on, face the unknown, and regenerate. Well, there you have it. It's quite a good story. Um, I was, at first I was thinking, did you get this from the Radio Times? It's really spoilery. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, sorry folks. Uh, sp- sp- spoilers alert. Although this was broadcast in 2017, so if you listen to now, it's, uh, yeah. go, away. <laughs> go away, watch it, and come back. Um, but I was thinking, but did, did they really put this bit of blurb out just before it was released? <laughs> but no, no, this is the complete, complete synopsis. No, okay. this is uh, just some self-indulgent <laughs> synopsis that I've written myself. <laughs> very good. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you'd put that out before it was broadcast, you would have got fired. <laughs> <laughs> very likely. So the episode kicks off with a flashback to how many episodes earlier? 709. 700, 709. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if anyone's disputed that. <laughs> what do you class as an episode? Yeah, I was going through that, but I haven't. I haven't counted any disputes. My, funny enough, my reaction when this was first broadcast was, "Ah, oh, seven hundred nine. That's in- impressive." But is that all? I thought it was more. But anyway, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> the, do- the doctor lies. Yeah, Maybe tr- um, Moffat lies too. <laughs> yeah. So we get the we finally catch up to the the end scene of the previous episode, and um, when he comes face to face with Bradley's doctor, um, and of course he delivers the line. He's the original, you might say. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. He's kind of quoting Herndl's doctor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Para- paraphrasing the fourth doctor, whilst imitating Hartnell. <laughs> My brain hurts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't bring hurt into this <laughs> <laughs> oh so just off the top of your head I, ha- I have to take your first answer mm-hmm. okay you have to answer straight away right how many doctors are in this story well it's all of them isn't it <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't an answer <laughs> well the reason I said all of them was are you including the cameo appearances where they're all in those glass little orbs where they show the first doctor is oh featured? no see I totally forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> well, just for simplicity, because they're just cameos, they're so, not the proper thing. It's okay, so all the Doctors, except the ones in that scene, including cameos in other scenes. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, I'll say uh, I'll say two and a half. Oh, I totally forgot the answer now. <laughs> oh, is it, no, is it three and a half? Well, I, I thought it's a, it's a four Doctor story, because you see Troughton, and you see Jodie Whittaker. But yeah, I totally forgot about that scene with testimony. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I forgot Patrick Trump, isn't it? Yeah. Where did you get the half from? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I was overthinking it because although although P- David Bradley is playing the first Doctor, right? He's sort it's of a, it's only a half measure kind of performance. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blimey, what a dig! No, um, no, what I was <laughs> what I was saying was. Um, it's, it's the first Doctor halfway between his regeneration. You know, because there's that line of going, oh, you're regenerating and your face is all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, it was a smart alecky response, which didn't quite work. But yeah, there's, uh, there's four, isn't there? Yes. Including all the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess that whole original, you might say, line, mm-hmm. it's kind of becoming, becoming the first Doctor's catchphrase, even though he never said it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the, the Hartnell didn't. Much like Alan Z, fantastic. Geronimo, Gallifrey stands. We agreed that was a catchphrase. <laughs> For the and war doctor, yeah, that's, that's all he ever said. When I say run, run, run. <laughs> yes. It's my favourite. One day we should come up with catchphrases for the doctors that haven't got one. Favourite one liners. <laughs> yeah. Which doctors haven't got one? I mean, uh, Colin Baker didn't have one, did he? Although carrot juice, carrot, carrot juice, juice, carrot juice has, instantly has, came to mind. Yes. Yeah, has has gone down in history. Um, what about McC- uh, yeah? McCoy? What, about, what about McCoy? Um, I- infinite rice pudding. It's unlimited rice pudding. Unlimited rice pudding. Unlimited rice pudding. <laughs> what would be the difference? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just quibbling. I'm just being pedantic. Um, or... What's the use of a good quote if you can't change it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. Although I love, I love how we haven't changed that one. <laughs> I think I think uh, McGann's doctor is just who am I? Who am I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> isn't it? Who am I? <laughs> we'll have to think of a better one for him. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Yeah, that's a bit. Uh... I'm not going to come up with one off the top of my head. I'm going to put a bit of thought into it. <laughs> um, another thing that's mentioned when um, the twelfth Doctor and the first Doctor meet. Um, the 12th Doctor states that it's the first time they've regenerated mm-hmm. just in case there was any doubt about whether he was the first Doctor or not although I know like the time of the Doctor had already cleared that up hadn't it um, yes yeah, yeah I think so but it's it's nice to have it um, sort of nailed for once I, d- I didn't think there was any real question of it until uh, the Tom Baker story The Brain of Morbius um, because there's a scene there which could be interpreted that we're seeing faces before the first Doctor. Um, right, yes. Although that could be interpreted as you're yeah, actually seeing faces of Morbius's previous regenerations or whatever. Mm. Um, it's not one of those things. To, uh, stop overthinking it. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's We can finally put our minds at rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Until it's retconned. Or that is explained that actually... Uh, Time Lords' numerical understanding of the of the number thirteen is uh, is a lot higher than humans or something. Of course, the twelfth Doctor rem- the twelfth Doctor doesn't remember trying not to regenerate. Mm-hmm. So obviously, the first Doctor is going to have his memory kind of blocked of this whole story. Yep. Do you think when Bradley's Doctor, well, well, sorry, I'll stop calling him that. Do you think when the first Doctor met the Twelfth Doctor, and realised who he was, do you think he regained his memories of the Three and the Five Doctors? No. Well, that answers that one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, 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 it's possible, but... Um, I mean, I think, I think it's up to you. If you, if, if you think uh, he would, then, you know, I think that's fine. It, um, it's one of those things where it wouldn't affect the story. Well, actually, it probably way. would. It probably would, because... Then he would already know he's got a hopeful future. It probably would affect the narrative. Oh yeah, that's true. I don't think he does, because uh, no. I think that would that would that would um, tie into this whole thing where so the the doctor doesn't have any memories of this until Peter Capaldi's doctor. Mm. So in the same way with the three doctors, Hartnell and Troughton's doctor wouldn't have any memory of it until Pertwee's doctor. Possibly, but. I think it was Terence Dix that put this idea out there that said, as the Doctors meet, this mind block is lifted, and they remember all the previous meetings. Oh, I didn't know that. All right, okay. 
Anyway, he's, he doesn't write all the rules now. So. <laughs> no, no, that's true. Yeah, sod off Terry Sticks. Jeez. <laughs> oh, and I might be wrong. Maybe there's something subtle I've missed, but do you think this is the first main TV multi-doctor story that doesn't have a telepathic link between the, the doctors? I hadn't thought of that. Uh, yes, I think it is. Because that, th- that was a theme we picked up on. Yeah, because I think up until this moment, it's something that had been in every multi-doctor story. Um, displayed differently, but it, it was always there. But yeah, now that you mention it, I think this is probably the one story where it's, where it's, not, it's not there. Yeah, we have to really go looking for it. Like, if they've got similar facial expressions, maybe we can think, oh yeah, they're sharing a little joke there or something. (laughs) So the 12th Doctor seems to be terrified of the consequences of the first Doctor dying. Um, Because obviously he's he's fought so many bad guys. (laughs) (laughs) So on balance, do you think the Doctor fought off more evil than he caused? I would have thought so, but I thought it was more of the case that he was worried for his own existence. Because obviously, <laughs> right. if, obviously, if the first Doctor doesn't regenerate, then none of the other Doctors happen. Right, okay, I, th- I thought he was being more selfless at the time. I mean, he, I mean, it's it's possible he may have been, but that that's um, that's always been the way that I've interpret- interpreted that. And the first Doctor said to the Twelfth, um, he would rather die as himself rather than change. Mm-hmm. It's always nice having new insight into the first Doctor. Um, and this is probably true with regards to the character, but it kind of resonates um, Hartnell's perspective as well. You know, um, when we watched An Adventure in Time and Space with mm-hmm. Bradley, of course, um, we'll learn more about Hartnell there. And of course, he had to hand the show over. And obviously he had mixed feelings about that would he would he rather let the show die than than go on as well so it probably wasn't intentional but it felt a little bit meta as well possibly that's since it was bradley saying it mm. yeah it, i mean it's possible i mean again i think um i mean that's that's an interesting view of it i think I think I've always taken a lot, a lot of this story at, at face value. So that's not something I've taken from it. But I think that's an interesting look at it. Um, just regards to that line, I think it's interesting that Paul Cornell, who's written the target novelization of uh, of this story, um, yes. he just he just embellishes on that line a little bit, which which is quite nice. He gives this idea that one of the reasons why he wanted to, to retain his uh, the appearance of his first incarnation a bit longer was because he wanted to see Susan again. Ah, right. In a, in a form that you know she was familiar with. Mm. Um, so I thought that that was a nice little embellishment in the novelization. That's probably something they couldn't have elaborated on in the TV um, TV version because obviously um, it would pull the narrative sideways a little bit, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's one of those things which it works in the novelization. I think if you were to try and incorporate that into the story, it would it would probably come across a bit uh, <clears throat> a bit clumsy. Yeah, it's a shame as well. That's probably put a bit of a nail in the in the coffin um, about us seeing Bradley and Caroline Ford together on screen in the new series. Yeah, that is a shame, and in fact, because when it was Peter Capaldi's final. Uh, series. We saw a photograph of Caroline Ford as Susan uh, on a couple of occasions when he, uh, on the, the desk in his uh, university office. And I thought that was a nice a nice touch and a nice sort of nod um, to, to classic Doctor Who and especially for, uh, the Hartnell era. But it does make me think it would, it would be nice if uh, Caroline Ford was to come back into the series mm. and p- play Susan at least once more. But it, but in a in a in a much stronger way, you know, not in oh she sprained her ankle again, you know, actually bring her back, have the whole thing. It's the Doctor's granddaughter, and um, have her written in a strong way and really involve her in the story. Yeah, yeah, I can't see how it would affect the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, you bring you bring in new characters every week in the show. Why not bring in old ones and use the strength of the history? You know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you don't want to do it all the time because I think that would you know that uh, dilutes the the potential and the impact. But well, I think once in a while, and and you can write these things in a way which um, 
doesn't alienate general viewers. You know, you can easily just present that the Doctor once had a granddaughter and here she is and, you know, you just crack on with the story. Yeah. So we get to see um, Mark Gates' character, the captain, Mm -hmm. on the battlefield. And I like his little speech with a German officer. It shows off more of, like, human empathy rather than, like, wartime prejudice. Yes, uh, in fact, they're both presented in very much the same way. The the German officer who's, uh, or soldier, um, who's obviously uh, speaking German, the German that he says uh, actually translates on the lines of um, please leave now, I do not want to kill you. All oh, right, okay. Um, but yeah, it was. I thought that that was a, a really nice moment. In fact, I would say that one of the Probably the greatest thing in this story is Mark Gatiss and the character he's playing, which is the captain. Yeah, I think he's uh, I think he's written superbly, and Mark Gatiss performs him brilliantly. And that that sense of um, selflessness and um, and bravery, mm-hmm. uh, because this was broadcast during a time when we were looking at the centenary of. The First World War, which obviously began um, in 2014, where we're looking back 100 years. Yeah. Um, some of it was quite tasteless. I think Sainsbury's using it as a way to um, advertise itself during the Christmas period was a bit, it was a bit questionable, personally. But anyway, you know, th- I think um, there was a lot of self-reflection, and Twice Upon a Time falls into that. And I think I think this is probably the, the greatest thing that I take away from the story is the moments where it's looking at the <coughs> First World War and the the Christmas Armistice, but those opening yeah. moments are. Um, I, I think, think that was a, that was a great end, and what what better thing to bring into a Christmas episode? Yes, than one of the, arguably one of the gr- the greatest Christmases there's ever been, because this was during a time when the world was at war, and yet ordinary s- soldiers on both sides forgot their differences in celebration of Christmas. <laughs> I think it's one of the, the greatest moments, and this isn't hyperbole. I generally mean this. I think this is, it's it's probably one of the greatest uh, moments that has has taken place in history. <clears throat> Again, this is something that Paul Paul Cornell, in just a few lines, but adds so much to it because, um, in the closing chapter, he mentions something which is true, which is the the attempted the same thing the following year, um, but. The generals on both sides, you know, stopped it. Yeah. Um, so this this was an, unfortunately a one-off, but an incredibly powerful. Um, and this is the this is the one thing that I think is the strength of Twice Upon a Time. It's it's real emotional resonance, and it um, it portrays those moments I think very very well. Yeah, and the captain's quite a good character. Of course, he tries to sacrifice himself for. Um... Bill as well, doesn't he? Yeah, um, so, you know, he's a very strong, stoic, uh, gallant character. Um, and very brave throughout. Uh, and, and so and I think in many ways he's um, he's a shorthand for, you know, the, the, the attitudes of the past, you know, that stoicism. Um, but also the, the bravery of all those who've, who fought in the First World War. Um mm. He sort of amalgamated into this one character, and I think this is uh, uh, Stephen Moffat. It's, it's arguably one of the, the best characters he's ever created, and um, embellished superbly by Mark Gatiss. Mm-hmm. And of course, we we'll see a, a contrast in his um, in his character. We see him in the TARDIS, and he's trembling with mm-hmm. fear yeah. because he's he's facing um, he's facing death, mm-hmm. and of course he. He overhears on the monitor, doesn't he, that he's being t- he was being returned to the point of his death. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's obviously hard, quite a hard thing to hear. Yes, yeah, yeah. From his point of view, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I love that line when he says, um, "Are either of you a doctor?" <laughs> Are you trying to be funny? <laughs> um, yeah, I, w- I mean, yeah, I suppose it, it's a funny line in of itself, but um, it's. Me personally, I think it's one of those. I think it's one of those moments uh, of of attempted humour in this story, which falls a bit flat for me. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, in of itself, it's funny, but I think in the context of the story, 
I, I, I don't think it quite works. And um, I know it doesn't quite fit in with what he's just been through. You know, he's if times just froze. Yes, he's been taken out out of his out of his setting. And mm. um, why would he say that? <laughs> but I think it, it's a lot of fun to have in a pre-title kind of thing. I think it's, it's pretty cool. No, no, that, that's fair enough. And I think because I think I think there are th- things about the story I think we're going to have different uh, opinions on, and I think this is one of them. And so I, I think it's great uh, that that's a line that you uh, that you appreciate. Great for me for the reasons that you've just said. It doesn't gel because it, it doesn't make any sense for the doctor to say that. It, it makes it's a joke that works for the audience rather than the context of the characters. Yeah, and there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that. It's just something that I that doesn't work for me and the i mean we'll come on to this later on but there's a lot of hu- attempted humor <clears throat> in the story which yes i know work. I one think... or two bits i'm thinking of now mm. that we'll get to yeah but the episode isn't short of um moments where the first doctor takes center stage mm-hmm. um we see the first doctor facing off with the apparent aliens which turns out to be testimony yeah. Um. Back when he's with the captain, the twelfth doctor, um, and of course the the twelfth doctor says, and yeah, and Earth is protected. And then the first doctor's like, it's what? <laughs> <laughs> and we get to see this amazing contrast between the first doctor and the twelfth. Yeah. Um. Whether you thought about it or not, it it's there. There's a big there's a big divide divide there. Another scene that I do like, um, is in the TARDIS when the doctor says blatantly an officer from the World War One, mm-hmm. um, and he replies what do you mean one? What did you think of that? you think that was a good liner? Yeah I think it's a very good line I th- it, it's interesting um, that it started to be referred to as the First World War whilst the war was still fighting but not at the stages of 1914 um, when this captain has been plucked out of time, I thought it was. I thought it was a very good line. It's very simple, and it you know it com- you know it conveys a lot because I think that if you were to inform those who sacrificed their lives that in a relatively short space of time um, the world would be plunged into war yet again, I think it would that, be, that could th- that could have you really diminished, couldn't it? Your spirit? Yeah, I, th- I think they would be devastated, and you yeah. know it was you know because it's referred to as the war to end all wars. Um, it was absolutely catastrophic um, and yet historically speaking, relatively speaking th- the Second World War happened pretty much five minutes later, it was no time at all um, mm. so I thought I thought it was, a, it was a very good line and it's a bit of a killer it's, um, it, says a, it says an awful lot uh, with a great deal of economy um, so I think that's a very good line from Stephen Moffat I like that a lot Um it displays very good writing. Uh, Ed, uh, what were your thoughts? Did you like it? Oh yes, I thought it was a great performance by um, Mark Gatiss in just one line. You know, it was mm-hmm. really conveyed what he was feeling. Yeah. Then we get to some of the sexist stuff. <laughs> um, the first Doctor makes a remark about the twelfth Doctor being his nurse. You know, older gentlemen like women can be put to use. <laughs> right. Let's get to it now that you mentioned it. Uh, the sexism of the first Doctor. Thanks. So, I hate so it. Do you think? Do you think it dishonors the views of Hartwell's Doctor? Yes. Um, I don't think there's anything in the first Doctor's era that indicates that the first Doctor was sexist. I there was one thing we picked up on. Herndl's Doctor was sexist. Yes, that's yeah, that is true about telling. But that's not that's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, because funny enough, yeah, we, we did mention that was sort of... Uh, but, I mean, the level that it's written into this episode is absolutely ridiculous. And I think these are moments that try to be humorous, which is what I was yeah. hinting at before, but they don't quite work. So, um, <clears throat> they the try not to confuse the captain about who they are. So the first Doctor steps in and goes, oh, he's my nurse. But then explains, yes, I know that that may seem a bit peculiar, but being a man. And then the 12th Doctor's just going, that's absolutely deplorable, da 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 Well, hang on, you're having this conversation with someone who's from 1914. The idea yes. of a man being a nurse isn't the norm. So that line doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, I don't like the 12th Doctor's uh, reaction to it. 
Um, so don't like that. Then later on, we have references to the Doctor saying that Polly should be here to clean the TARDIS. Yeah. Um, it's just more of the same over and over, isn't it? We're bombarded with these Yeah, we're just bombarded jokes. with these sexist uh, moments. Uh, uh, and then later on, you know, women are made of glass. And then you it, got... it betrays my view of the Doctor because I always thought, regardless of which Doctor it is, I always see him as being morally superior, you know, or mature. Well, to an extent. I mean, remember when we're introduced to the first Doctor in, you know, the first few stories, An yes. Unearthly Child, the Daleks, Edge of Destruction in particular. He is morally questionable. So it's quite interesting that he's he finds the Daleks absolutely morally abhorrent because they're willing to commit mass genocide um, for racist reasons, to put it simply. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. But in the previous story, he, he was willing to kill an innocent person, um, you know, the caveman. I think it's in episode three of An Unearthly Child. So it's... But what you see with the first Doctor is he becomes a better person through through his interactions with uh, Ian and Barbara. And that's something that tends to get written into the series, particularly with the new one, the new series, funny enough. It's this idea that his companions make the Doctor better and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, there were some some moral quibbles that one could have with the first Doctor, but he developed. But yeah. this thing <clears throat> of him, but that was written into the stories. And, you yeah. know, we see that development and we see that change. That's fine. This thing about the Doctor being sexist, um, I mean, okay, of the period in the 1960s, you know, the way that women were treated is different now because, you know, progress has been made. Fantastic. But to the extent that the first Doctor is displayed here is absolutely ridiculous and I think really cheapens yeah. uh, the memories and the hard work and everything that actually William Hartnell did to the fir- uh, did playing the first Doctor. And of course he's a time traveller. Yeah. He, he's constantly in um, different different scenarios and different eras mm-hmm. with different social views. Uh-huh. But, I mean, but, but in this instance, he feels like he's out of his era. It's strange. Yeah, it's, it's really odd. I mean, I don't remember the, uh, any of the Doctors, but in this case, especially the first, making a big deal of the companions, uh, the female companions cleaning <clears throat> the TARDIS, or making yeah. references that, uh, that women are d- you know, delicate beings made of glass and therefore have no substance. I mean, where the hell does this come from? This is, the, this is one bit of this uh, Twice Upon a Time I really, really dislike. I, th- I, think, it's, I think it's crap. Yeah. Um, well, this was probably my wife's first experience of seeing the first Doctor, mm. and that's the one thing she took away from it. Well, yeah, you would. Yeah. I mean, because it's not as if it's... Uh, I mean, wh- it's not as if it was one line, which probably would raise people's eyebrows. It's, it's written throughout the entire episode. It's yeah. really bizarre. And it's one thing... There are certain things about the story which Stephen Moffat has written in, which I really like. You know, we mentioned it before, which was that that line about the First World War and the Second World War. That's yeah. really well written. There's a it's it's uh, there's a lot packed into just very few words. That's really good writing. That's signs of a good writer. But then he's written this in, and I really don't like it. And what's interesting is, following its broadcast and now, it's the one thing that a lot of people, I think, rightly criticise the episode for. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Because there was a there was a lot to draw contrast from between the 12th and the 1st Doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, when I said the thing about Capaldi saying Earth is protected, mm-hmm. you've, got, you've, got a, you've got two different personas here um, facing off against each other, the 1st mm-hmm. and 12th Doctors. Yeah. It, why bring um, social views into it? Well, the thing is, right, because the, 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 this is one element of the 1st Doctor that I think Stephen Moffat really misses the mark. Uh, it's not the first Doctor at all. But later on uh, in the story, when you've got uh, the Bill Potts avatar, the, the Bill Potts testimony avatar, and she's trying to det- you know try to find out why the Doctor left Gallifrey, what was he running to, what was he trying to find out, that speech that he gives about he's trying to find the nature of the universe and you know the nature of good versus evil and why does yeah. good prevail, <clears throat> yeah. that's really good. It's it's spot on. Like you, you really want insight into the first Doctor, which you've never had, mm-hmm. and they present us with this fundamental question that he started off with, 
Mm-hmm. And it really does hit the mark, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it really hits the mark. I think that's very well written. I think it's a really nice <coughs> scene. It's uh it's I love everything about that. And it's the the first doctor's outlook. It's sort of yeah, I can see that transplanted into the early sixties series and go, yeah, that explains one aspect of the first doctor and what the doctor was trying to find out. So in that aspect, Stephen Moffat has really nailed the first doctor. Yeah. Uh so, you know, <clears throat> that bit I really, really like, that element of the characterization and that moment when David Bradley's performing it. I think that's great. But this this constant reference to the first doctor was sexist because I mean I don't know what. It's not in the stories. Is Stephen Moffat trying to make uh is trying to make, is he trying to just make um a comment on how women were treated uh, largely in the 1960s even though that's not really part of Doctor Who and what was in the stories no it's it, that's that's one the, the one element of Twice Upon a Time I really <clears throat> take issue with so whose view do you share about the TARDIS do you prefer well lit flight deck for the most sophisticated ship in the universe or a restaurant for the French <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. That actually, that was one line that I liked. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a restaurant for the French. I did like that for all the um, for all the decrying I've just done of, of the failed comedy. That there were one or two lines that I think yeah. did 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 make me chuckle. That was one of them. Another um, one was um, when David Brad- well, sorry, when Peter Capaldi's got his sunglasses on. Mm-hmm. The twelfth Doctor hadn't noticed the different the the details on the the glass avatars. <laughs> In the daughters, while you're indoors, you wear sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes, there were one or two moments where it, it it did work, and there was nice contrast, and it was sort of, you know, for all the technological sophistication that the current Doctor has, nothing nothing beats just natural observation. Yeah. Um. But with the but displaying that that difference in a, in the comedy, so yeah, that worked. Um. Yeah. I always have a soft soft spot, I suppose, for. Um, the classic TARDIS, but I mean, the, the, but the actual the the one that we see in the very first episode of An Earthy Child, because I think even to this day it's a fantastic design, and yes. it's nice to see that replicated uh, here. It's not it's not hundred percent, but it's 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 bringing that that classic design and just yeah. tweaking it slightly <clears throat> so it's for a modern audience. Yeah. It works really well. I think it's very good. I like how the Twelfth Doctor sent the first Doctor out to keep testimony talking. It gives us a chance to see the first Doctor taken centre stage. But that kind of... The over, overbearing element of that is they're mentioning the Doctor of War. The Twelfth Doctor seems quite concerned on that when we see him in the TARDIS <laughs> that they've mentioned that. And I think, obviously, testimonies confused the first Doctor for the Twelfth, haven't they? I think initially. Yeah. But obviously the fact that they're going... I think the fact that they show him his future shows well we know I suppose, yeah. where you where you are in your own timeline. Here's your future incarnations. Um, I think it's it's again it's it's a bit of an interesting choice. I mean I know that there was this whole thing about the Doctor fighting the Time War and all the rest of it, and I don't know I don't buy the the Doctor of War thing. I think Although it sets up that great line at the end, doesn't it? So this is what it means to be the Doctor of War. Yes, that's true. Um, I was just about to mention that. Yeah, it, it does set uh, it does set that up, but I feel it's one of those things where it was it was put in for no other reason than oh, I've got this idea for describing the Doctor of War. Or I'll, I'll structure it in this particular way because that doesn't really gel. No, and I think it emphasizes a bit more when with some of the clips that they use. I mean, the one that always stands out to me is uh, they use a clip of uh, Peter Davison in Ark of Infinity. And it's the bit when he's uh, shouting at the Time Lords that it doesn't alter the fact that there's a traitor here on Gallifrey because he's about to be carted off and being executed by the Time Lords. Yes. Doctor of War? What? Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. It, there is that great line at the end of the episode where so that what, that's what it means to be a Doctor of War. You know, you, you help people in need. You help yeah. people in war. So it works in that sense, but the initial, but that only works if the initial reaction is, oh, he, he's someone who fights in war. Yeah. 
And at that and, and this point in the show, the whole thing to do with the, the time war has been has been dealt with. So it seems a bit over egged. Yeah, they mentioned the Doctor of War, which is the one facet of his personality that kind of broke the fundamentals of who he is. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's a strange one to bring up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's it's the one it's the one aspect of himself which he's deeply ashamed of. So the twelfth Doctor's reunited with Bill. Only mm-hmm. one episode after her big departure. <laughs> yep. The same thing happened with Clara. Remember when she died, and then she came. St- Right back, the next episode, more or less. Yeah, I remember ep- it well. Two episodes later. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> w- whether it's effective or not, mm-hmm. it, it, just, it betrays the departure, doesn't it? It's strange. Yeah, but then, I mean, this is something that um, New Who has done an awful lot. So, when Rose departed, that was incredibly emotional. And yet, she's popped up a few times since. Uh, the whole... At least, we, at least we had to wait for Rose. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, it wasn't immediately, and it, so it it sort of it sort of worked. It didn't feel a massive cheat to begin with. Uh, and then the same thing ha- happens with Donna. Um, she leaves the series in an incredibly powerful and emotional way, uh, and then she pops up not long after. I think of all of them, though, Clara's Clara's the worst in, in the sense that you know she dies, she comes back two stories later. <laughs> One of the things I absolutely love about about this, though, is that when Clara makes an appearance at the end, and the, because in Hellbent the Doctor it ends with the Doctor forgetting Clara, well now he remembers her. It's fantastic because this not only makes Hellbent an awful episode, but now utterly pointless. Okay, yes, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I mean, I think um, I suppose you could argue that the fact she makes an appearance and that she's a part of testimony showed that she did eventually go back to Gallifrey um, to, Well, yes, to of course, the universe and the web of time would have just disintegrated <laughs> yeah, so, if she hadn't. Yeah. So I, su- I suppose it, she was probably written in the sense to cover that up, but the fact that the, t- the, fact that the Doctor remembers her, yeah. which is great, but it goes, well, he should never have forgotten her in the first place. Yeah. So hell bent is not only crap, but it's pointless. Yeah. So after we get the whole sequence of testimony showing the, showing the first Doctor all these snippets of his of his future lives, mm-hmm. um, oh, well, do you think that was a fair interpretation of the first Doctor's reaction when he's like, "What was that?" <laughs> um, I do like how Capaldi put it in. So to be fair, they cut out all the jokes. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that was that was quite nice, um, <laughs> and I feel like he was genuinely genuinely saying that. <laughs> yeah, it does feel like that's a. Uh, I mean, Stephen Moffat may have written that line, but I think because of the delivery, it does come across like a brilliant uh, Capaldi ad lib. It's being uh, sincere, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, to answer your question, yeah, I think that is. A, I think that is a good uh, reaction from the first Doctor because he's basically been given. Uh, a significant glimpse into his uh, into his uh, future and all the adventures and all the rest of it, and I think that would be quite overwhelming. Oh, and the um, twelfth Doctor, the first Doctor, and Bill, they all escape down the change. J- sorry, <laughs> they all escape down the chains beneath mm. the TARDIS. Yeah, um, it was quite a good action team for the first Doctor. Has he been through anything like that before? Do you think? <laughs> I don't think so. Not if you watch the first, uh, if you watch the uh, the first three series, that is quite energetic for the first Doctor. I mean, if they were being historically accurate, he would have, you know, broken a hip or something. Um, well, yes, but the do- both the Doctors are in a state of grace now. He's back to full energy. Oh, that's true. Oh, that explains it. They've, they've sort of explained that. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's. He's fine. got full full time load endurance. He's yeah. fine. <laughs> if if, um, if Ten can jump through sky skydive through a roof. The first Doctor can land. That's, I'll, I'll settle with that. Yeah, I suppose it neatly ties. Because <laughs> that's the thing. If you look at um, <laughs> the end of time and uh, <laughs> to, to the 10th Doctor just from a tremendous height crashing through a roof. <laughs> uh, and then we've got uh, Jodie Whittaker at the end of this story f- 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 plummeting thousands <laughs> of feet. Right, and you're going... Bloody hell! The fourth Doctor was pretty weak. He just he just fell from a gantry and died. And you can think of 
plenty of other situations where they've been like fully subdued, you know, by by um, enemies. You know, they can just be like knocked over and they're, they're injured or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> oh, and I love the line when they're back on the ground and the, the doctor's like, "No, it's another of the same TARDIS." <laughs> what do you think of the thing of um, calling the first when he refers to the doctor as Mister Pastry and Mary Berry and all that? <laughs> Um, I don't know. I was fine with it. <laughs> yeah, I was fine with it. Uh, those things did make me chuckle. Although, of course, these are cultural references. The first, why haven't they got the first one? Going, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who the hell's Mister Pastry? Oh. <laughs> Funnily enough, on my notes, I've got down Saint Elaine over to you, Mary Berry. <laughs> 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 well, thanks very much. <laughs> now the viewers are trying to visualise you. <laughs> If I didn't nail on the head, I look like Mary Berry, but just with the de- <laughs> just with the deeper voice <laughs> and slightly crappy cakes. I'm the poor man's Mary Berry. <laughs> I am a bit tired of the constant "the windows are the wrong size" gag. Um, yes, because even Capaldi kind of takes a step back and has a glance at the windows before he goes in, doesn't he? Yeah, and it's just like yeah, it was maybe funny in Blink, but oof, I'm sick of hearing it now. Um, but it was, it was nice to see that they they built um, the the original prop to spec. And yes, it, it, it does look good. The twelfth Doctor suggests accessing the Matrix mm-hmm. at one stage. Um, it's interesting that the twelfth Doctor feels like he's able to just go back to Gallifrey. Um, and it's also interesting to imagine how that would have played out. Put the first Doctor in that setting. Of Gallifrey. Yeah, that's true, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why we don't actually do that because it would raise, you know, too many questions and kind of new areas and all the rest of it. Um, but it does raise the whole thing of this idea that the Daleks database is the biggest in biggest in the universe, bigger even than the Matrix. Yes. Um, I mean, just in terms of the mythology of the show. And as, as I've said in previous podcasts, I'm, I'm not too fussed with a constant focus on, on continuity. But even for me, that struck this struck me as a bit odd um, because f- the Matrix is the <clears throat> it, you know the biggest repository of all knowledge. My understanding is that it, it is the biggest database in the entire universe. So the idea that... I mean, it, it, I can buy it that the Dalek database would have the information that the Doctor wants. That's yeah. fine. But just the way that it's sort of described as being bigger than the Matrix, I thought was a bit peculiar. Yes, because when they arrived to see the the rusty Dalek, mm-hmm. um, which is nice revisiting, it was a bit of a thing that was just left open, and it's been brought back at the, at the in the last minute of mm-hmm. the era, hasn't it? Um, they arrive at Villain God, which was mentioned in the Doctor Dances. Oh, was in, it in Stephen Moffat's story? Um, in his World War Two World War Two story with Captain Jack. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Captain Jack's got this um his gun, the squareness mm-hmm. gun, <laughs> and he says um. Oh, he destroyed all the um. Yes, all the, and there's, the a, there's a banana system. growth in the heart of Villengard. Ah, right, I remember. And that... this is the same place, yeah. Ah, I didn't clock that. I remember that uh, the line of dialogue, but I couldn't remember the place he mentioned. Yeah. All right, okay, that's a that's an interesting inclusion. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. something I never picked up on. That's yeah. good. Now that I've mentioned bananas, you want one? Uh, no, um, there's something that didn't quite sit right with me in "Let's Kill Hitler." We, you know, with Mel's going back to kill Hitler. Oh, the swapping of the gun with the banana. Swapping of the gun. Now they take a banana from Hitler's fruit bowl. Historically, they take the wrong variety of banana. They use a Cavendish, and it should have been a Gros Michel variety. <laughs> wow, blimey. That really that's... bothered me. They didn't genetically exist at this point. Wow, that's quite impressive. I thought, because I, I mean, I know that, because uh, I know that we didn't sell uh, bananas until 1946, which was after the Second World War, so I thought you were going to mention something on that. Those lines, not the actual genus of banana. That's quite impressive. How on earth did you know that? I don't know, I thought it was just common knowledge, you know, um, you know, well, you know how, well, you might not know, because you don't, might not go to McDonald's, but if you went and got a banana milkshake now, mm-hmm. um, 
you recognise the flavour that you get from a banana milkshake, yeah? Sort of. It's, it's a bit... Now, it's, it's... now, it's not the taste of bananas, yeah? Yeah. Uh, but it is the taste of these bananas that are now extinct. Oh. And And this new variety, the Cavendish ones, are the ones we're getting now, which are longer <laughs> and thinner and a bit more tasteless. Right. So what you're saying is... We're... When when I get a banana milkshake and I'm going, well, this doesn't taste like a banana. It tastes yeah. Like, I'm actually tasting how Hitler would have tasted it. <laughs> Not how I would have phrased it, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Okay. So a, mo- a modern day true banana milkshake should probably be tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> For that reason, they're not. Right. Okay. Uh, I never realised that now having a banana milkshake would be ethnically questionable. <coughs> I like it, but so did Hitler. Oh, damn. Sorry, I've gone off topic here. <laughs> so we get a good talk with Bill and the Doctor outside the TARDIS. Mm-hmm. This is the scene where the first Doctor comes out and he says he'll give her a good smack bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the 12th Doctor seems to warm a bit to what a bit more towards Bill. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think he was considering that she's really, she really is Bill, or at, or at the very least, could he be reevaluating his definition of what qualifies as a person? I think I don't. I mean, given that the the way that we see his reaction develop through the story and and even towards the end, I don't think he um, is fully comfortable with the idea, and I don't think he. Maybe he's more uncomfortable with the fact that it's a violation of his friend. I think in terms of that scene, I think the reason why he smiles and comforted is because the way that she reacts is um, is exactly how Bill would react. And I think yeah. it's the fact that, you know, she's talking about, I hope we talk about it loads and basically, you know, carry on being friends. And I think the Doctor, you know, naturally would be quite um, warmed to that idea, if we can put it like that. Um, yeah. So I think that's the reaction there, um, but I don't think he's. He doesn't think the whole thing's a host like a hostile thing, but um, I, th- I think the doctor still finds it a bit questionable. Yeah, I think as this story progresses, you see a change in his views, mm-hmm. which we'll get to at the end. Um, then the first doctor explains why he's refusing to regenerate. He says, "He says fear. I'm afraid." But he doesn't really get to elaborate more on that, does he? Or did I miss something? No, no, he, I, I, he doesn't necessarily elaborate on it. But I don't, personally, I don't think he needs to. I think it's, um, I think it's clear that he's, he's scared of the change, because it's the first yeah. time that the Doctor is going to regenerate, and he doesn't. You know, it's sort of like a, a massive leap into the dark for him, and you know, he's. Um, that's why he's scared. Yeah, I suppose you could think. In the same way we we're talking about testimony, it is another violation. It's like another man's going to come in with your memories mm-hmm. and imitate you. So there's a little bit of a parallel there. Ah, oh, that Dalek's a lousy shot, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. Like a uh, stormtrooper. I mean, suppose, I mean, you know, he's be, he's been going around killing Daleks for thousands of years. Um, I think he is going to be a bit rusty. That was <laughs> deliberate. <laughs> It's back to yeah, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, in last week's podcast, we revisited the Whispers of Terror, mm-hmm. yeah, which is a big finished story with Colin Baker. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this story, um, testimony extracts memories, and Bill insists that 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 makes her real enough, mm-hmm. and. This is a similar. This is similar to Vistia Crane in Whispers of Terror. You've got a copy of a memory, but you're treating it as a life form. You're treating it as the as the as the person. Mm-hmm. Well, I think. I mean, yes, I, I can see the point, and that did that did cross my mind when when I, uh, I rewatched Twice Upon a Time for this podcast. I think with the Whispers of Terror. It's its own life form because it isn't. Um, it isn't just a memory. It um, 
it's something that can be tortured and think for itself and make its own actions and have free will and so on. Whereas, I suppose you could say that the same is the same with testimony, but it's not quite. To me, this is just a basically a sophisticated video recording. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, unless you like to believe that the soul has piggybacked on to the copy, mm-hmm. um, it's either way. It's it's a you could compare the two entities in the same mm-hmm. way, couldn't you? Yeah, Possibly. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it's just a <laughs> comparison. I was looking, uh, I noticed <laughs> because we've just been talking about that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it crossed my mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, testimony, Bill. Um, had a go at the doctor about regenerating. So, mm-hmm. obviously, testimony knows how vital the doctor is to the universe. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they know that because they've shown um, the Doctor of War footage <laughs> to the <laughs> yeah. first. Unless, as if for some reason, the uh, it's just it, I automatic. No matter how many times I've watched it, I know I do, the, the, there is a clip from Genesis of the Daleks. I think that's in there. But for some reason, the one that stands out for me the most is the Ark of Infinity. Right. No idea why. I don't know whether it's it, it was because of how it's placed in that montage. But yeah, Ark of Infinity. Mm, I'll have to go, go back and rewatch them. Mm. Um, so also, testimony says the captain has to die. Yeah. And the doctor say, "Oh, all right then. I'll just take him back and let him yeah. die." <laughs> what did he? What did he feel about that? Well, that was. I mean, that was always on the cards, and but they had to do that anyway because they plucked him out just before he died and he was always going to have to die it's just that they they mucked it up yeah and that was to do with the fact that there was this error in time because the first doctor was refusing to regenerate at the same time that the 12th doctor was refusing so yeah. there's a bit of a glitch um sorry rob what was the question well i'm just saying that the 12th doctor didn't argue with testimony about taking the captain back to die i know the doctors faced this this dilemma lots of times before mm-hmm. and has had lots of different opinions on it um, but in this instance he just kind of agrees to take him back I was wondering what you thought on that whether it was the right choice yeah I, th- I think so because I think yeah. the, the question that that we've raised it's, it's more to do with testimony rather than anything else I do, I do think their practice is quite unethical um it is rather a shame that because of this muck-up, um, he's having to reface the dilemmas yeah. of death as well. But of course, the Doctor finds a way out, yeah. which is delaying the return by, by an hour or two, so he actually survives because of the, the Christmas armistice. Yeah. And of course, um, the first and the twelfth Doctors are revealed to have been the cause of the timeline error. Mm-hmm. Is that because of the lethbridge steward connection? Like why? Why did the timeline error occur, and why did why was the captain dropped on the on the doorstep of the TARDIS, more or less? I don't think it's because of the link with uh, the Brigadier. I think it's it's one of those things. Just coincidental. I think it's coincidental. I don't know if I quite buy that, but I don't know. Mm. Although you could look at it the other way around. The Doctor's got this link, this compulsion to look after the Brigadier because of the Captain. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm not... I'm sort of a bit indifferent about it because I, it's... Um... See, I'm fine with that because maybe even though the first Doctor doesn't retain his memory of this story, maybe on some subconscious level he does... See, I think it's just down to a preference. I just, I, my personal preference is, the Doctor just happens to encounter the Brigadier and befriends him without this promise that he made. Yeah. Uh, but then it's, it's not something that has a massive detriment to the show. That's why I'm sort of indifferent to it. Yeah. I, I don't think it. I mean, my preference is I don't think it's needed. No. But eh, whatever. It is what it's, it is. It's a nice touch, but it doesn't quite fit. Maybe. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, well, that's my take on it, yeah, that's yeah. my view. In the first Doctor did say what's so important about one captain. Mm-hmm. And I, my interpretation of that was as the viewer, we're asking the question, wait, what's so important about him? And then later on, we find out what is important about him. I thought yeah. maybe, maybe, I thought maybe that was implying 
well, that's the, the, thing. the link to the brig. You've actually reminded me another there. another issue of why I have a I have a problem with it because his importance is that of another human being. His importance yes. shouldn't shouldn't just belie in the fact that he happens to be the grandfather of a friend of theirs. Yeah. Um. That, yeah. That, that. Yeah. That, that was another issue that I had with it. It sort of implies his importance is because of that friend connection rather than his importance is he's a man who yes. he's another human who deserves to live. So that's yeah. That's another issue that I had with it. Yeah, totally. And of course, the first Doctor's quite impressed that the Twelfth Doctor saved them. When he says, oh, that's what it means to be the Doctor of War. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, a, which is a, you know, a nice moment. I know that we were saying before, uh, the lead-up to this... The, the lead-up to this um, is, is maybe a bit... Um, Overragged, and I'm not sure I entirely buy it, but it it, it is a nice moment, and uh, David Bradley plays it quite well. Totally. And he says, "I think I'm ready now." And he goes off to regenerate. Mm-hmm. And thanks to the moth, now we've seen all the regenerations. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. And up until this point, we weren't aware that we were missing the first up the regeneration fully until now. Because well, no, with, with the, no, I, even though I'm not referring to the fact that the footage is missing fully, but um, we'd had it on screen, but obviously not to the full extent until now. Oh yeah, because of this this interaction of a future doctor, we weren't aware of until now. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole um, getting there the long way around is introduced. It's like the twelfth doctor mentioned that, even though his era betrayed the whole going to Gallifrey the long way around <laughs> yeah. yes and, and but now he's put the words into the um, first doctor's mind mm-hmm. and then they emerge in the 11th doctor's dreams <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez uh, it's too complicated keeping a, <laughs> keeping tabs on all this and it's interesting even though they used the 10th doctor's death music for the first doctor if you'd noticed. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it actually works well. <laughs> um, yeah, it does, because that's another thing, because Twice Upon a Time marks the end of uh, the era. Peter Capaldi's leaving, Stephen Moffat's leaving, and Murray Gold, who had been uh, who had been providing um, the the music since the show came back in 2005 with Rose. Yeah. Um, this is his final episode as well. But it's a bit funny, because... The soundtrack works, that's fine, but there's very little original material, yeah. and it is sort of it is. I think it is Murray Gold, basically providing the best of, the greatest hits of Murray yeah. Gold. Occasionally, we do get pieces of music that are recycled, mm-hmm. especially in the um, Day of the Doctor. And no, I'm not saying that there's uh, there's anything wrong with that, but I think what's interesting is certainly towards the end of this episode, it it is quite noticeable. Yeah. And but our, our, like you said, it fit, fits well. Mm-hmm. Would have been nice to have something new, but I I think it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great merging with the tenth planet footage mm-hmm. in Trout and if Trout and appears. Yeah. Um, the twelfth Doctor goes for a walk with Bill after this. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you think you accept what she is now? Maybe, well, maybe we've already discussed that. Sorry, but um. He doesn't reject her at this point, does he? No, no, he doesn't. Yeah. And they all go for a hug. Yeah, she defends that um, memories are important. Mm -hmm. Of course, she brings back Clara's memories for him. Um, And of course, how could the Doctor argue with that? I mean, a man is the sum of his memories. (laughs) A time lord, even more so. (laughs) All right, Liam. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, couldn't resist it. Does Nardal spoil the mood of the scene? <laughs> Just a uh, question. I'm not. I'm not saying he, he does. No, no, I, I don't think he does. I quite like it. I mean, because yeah. uh, I, I, I loved Mark uh, Lucas uh, in the show playing Nardal. I thought he was a great character, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's a good scene. Um, I like what he says, and I just love you know just oh cuddle. Yeah, uh, and it's so him. It's sort of it's that. Uh, it's one of those things that I think Mark Luke, Mark, 
Uh, Matt, Matt, Lucas, Matt Lucas, yeah. Sorry, uh, Matt Lucas uh, brought the character. It That's fine. Fa- I I grew up thinking his name was George Dawes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss shooting stars. Can I have spuds, please? Spuds! Good choice. George's song. Listen very carefully. The question comes straight after. <laughs> Potato changed my life. Big potato showed me the way. If you want to know what is wrong from right, you must listen to what potatoes say. To be good, don't be bad. Big potato, don't be happy, don't be sad. Thank you, big potato. And if you want to have a better day. You must listen to what the big potato say. To be early, don't be late. Thank you, big potato. Always eat what's on your plate. Thank you, big potato. I think you want to have a better day. You must listen to what the big potato say. P-A-K-E-T-P-O-T-A-T-O. Big potato. <laughs> That was a great show. Yeah. Oh, I loved uh, it on those rare occasions when he came in as Marjorie Dawes. His, <laughs> his mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another question, does Noddle have hair? Yeah, what do you have... what, what do you you choose to believe he does, yes. <laughs> no, he's bald. <laughs> <laughs> it's invisible hair. That's just ridiculous. But yeah, it's uh, that, that was quite funny. I think uh, I think at that point that that was a nice little moment because um we know that, I mean, we've just had quite an emotional uh, scene because that's the whole thing to do with the, the Christmas armistice and I think that's that's quite powerful and very emotional and obviously yes. very serious. And we know that we're now leading into um, the Doctor's regeneration, so we're now you know, leading into yeah. something quite dramatic for the show. And of course, uh, I think, sorry, Noddle does have a purpose here because as it turns out, he's the one who directly asked the Doctor not to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, go, going back to you there. No, no, that's right. That's a good point. And yeah, so that, that all ties up. But I think that that moment with Nardle and the oh, Cuddle, it just uh, alleviates the moment a bit, which I think is, was probably needed. And it was and timed then, quite well. And then they leave the Doctor alone in the battlefield and all he's left with is, is his memories now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe that was the point of testimony, put, to put emphasis on... Um, all the Doctor's got left is memories. I do like the Doctor's speech when he goes back into the TARDIS. Um, the first time I listened to it, I thought perhaps it was a bit long. Well, this is really weird. I think the Doctor's regeneration with that speech, it's too long. It's self-indulgent. Um, I think it would have been quite nice had... We had the line, I suppose one more lifetime wouldn't kill anyone except me. Yeah. And then the Doctor regenerates. I think that would have been quite nice. Yet despite all that, it works. Yes. It's really weird. I mean, yes, it's a bit too long. It's a bit rambling. Um, you get this, this. This is more Peter Capaldi rather than this is the Doctor. So you're taken out of the character a bit. Yes. Um, they're doing it for for their own sake and yeah it is a bit self-indulgent and i sh- I, it's one of those things that it, i should find it irritating and i should find oh this needs to be truncated this could have worked so much better and as i say you had that great line and that would have been a great last line for his doctor yet despite all that i think i think peter capaldi's performance the way it's directed the cinematography everything yeah. uh, the music which again, it's 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 uh, Murray Gold has sort of raided his archive and it's it's reusing music, but it it all gels and somehow it works. Even the TARDIS talks to him, yeah, yeah. Um, it does. He does kind of go on about a lot of nonsense, but then obviously, if you're a viewer of the show and you're familiar with what he's talking about, mm-hmm. he kind of paraphrases what he'd said to Clara when he said goodbye to her. In the TARDIS, doesn't he? About pears. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there's and a lot. Of, there's a lot of meaning to everything he says. Yeah, and um, apparently the whole thing about um, the only people who will know the Doctor's name and understand it is uh, is when the the stars are aligned and children are listening. 
apparently that's something that Peter Capaldi had said at a um, at a Doctor Who convention, and it was quite well received. And so that so that was written in uh, t- to the speech. Yeah, I was um, just about to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, as I say, I, I think the whole thing uh, about this regeneration shouldn't work, but somehow <coughs> it does, and it's it's tremendous. I think uh, it's a that scene in itself. I think is a good send off. We have the introduction of Jodie Whittaker. We have another reference. Uh, you know, when the the Doctor's wedding ring falls off. Yeah, that's a reference to. Pedro Trouton's first story, The Power of the Daleks, when the first Doctor's ring doesn't fit and keeps on falling yes. off. Um, we'll so have the, the cloister bell. Yay! Yay! <laughs> the best bit of the scene. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, the regeneration itself shouldn't work, but it does. It's a good send-off for Peter Capaldi, and it's a, it's a really good introduction to Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. Yeah. If you put this scene in comparison with the Tenth Doctor's death, yeah. It really shows how the Doctor can deliver a speech on his death, doesn't it? Well, that's the thing. It's, so you've got this one scene where, as I say, it's it's a massive speech. And you go, this is too long and da-da-da and all the rest of it. Basically what I've just said, but somehow it works. And then compare that, as you say, to Tennant's Doctor, where he we have this thing where he he makes a big deal of visiting his previous companions and being moody and making a scene and da 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 and, it goes on and on and on. I think it goes on for a good 20 minutes or something ridiculous. And then I don't want to go. And it's just like, oh, sod off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so even, I mean, com- comparing it to those two, that this this one, the, the regeneration twice upon a time, uh, is, is much better anyway. I really don't like the regeneration of the Tenth Doctor. No, not at all. A lot of people do. Or some people do, at least. Oh, it's idiots! I've I've read so many people, so many comments from people saying they were in tears. Oh, did the uh, oh well, thank, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm being really arsy, and I should. No, it's great that there's people out there who who d- d- you know uh, who do get the the emotion of that, and it really touches them, and they do enjoy it. That's great, um, but just for me, it's um, uh, no, to me, to me like it, it betrays the development of his character. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I, thought hope, would, I thought he would have had more self dignity, you know. Like, um, well, he goes on a massive rant. He really, yeah. la- he really get um, Bernard Cribbing's character. Uh, he really laces into him, and it's really nasty. And you're going, where on earth has this come from? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got problems with the end of time. I really don't. I, there are good things about it. There are th- oh, the things I really don't. But anyway. Mm. I suppose just talking about it uh, because you know earlier on we were talking about the, the best and the worst of first Doctor stories what would you say are the best and worst of um, last Doctor stories that's a hard one um, I'd like to put a bit of thought into that um, because I'd rank the, the the deaths differently than I would rank the stories Oh, right, okay, yeah. Hmm. I really don't know. Have you got any thoughts on that right now? Um, I think I'm about, probably same as you, a little bit stumped. I suppose in terms of the best at the top of my head, I, I don't know whether to give it to the War Games or the Caves of Androzani. Mm. Funny enough, in terms of the worst, um, I don't know whether to say if it's um, the end of time or twice upon a time. Um, I mean, at some point we'll, we we may look at the end of time and look into it a bit further. Um, but even though we've got problems with it, and I don't particularly like the way that the Tenth Doctor behaves in that story, certainly towards the end, and I think the regeneration's a bit self-indulgent. What it does have is a sense of scale and threat, and it sort of sums up in many respects the the Tenth Doctor's era. Um, Twice Upon a Time's a bit of a funny one. Um, it's doing something different, which is always good, and d- don't don't mind that. But my view is that the the last story of a Doctor should be epic and should allow um, should allow the Doctor to go out on a on a high. Um, 
And in that respect, I think the previous story, World Enough and Time and the Doctor Falls, would have been a much better story just to have Peter Capaldi end there and regenerate yeah. at the end of that story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go and then go straight into the Jodie Whittaker era or whatever. I think that would have been much better. The problems that I have with Twice Upon a Time is... Um, Okay, well, on the positive, it's doing something new. Um, there are elements of the first Doctor that I quite like, where Stephen Moffat has nailed that, has nailed it in the writing. The sexist stuff, on the other hand, I think fails on that massively. Yes. Um, the story itself is quite light, um, and I think it's it's just a bit of a bizarre choice to end an era with with a story which sort of falls a bit flat in terms of the Doctor regenerating. Where, it do, where I think that the episode certainly succeeds on, as at its best, is uh, everything to do with the First World War. That's when it's at its best, and it has a re- it has real heart and real emotional resonance and all the rest of it. That's the best bits that I take away from this episode. Um, so that's why I'm sort of debating whether where I place Twice Upon a Time as a final story mm. of, of the Doctor. Um, I think... F- I think the story's fine, but I think Peter Capaldi should have been offered the opportunity to end on a story which was much more epic. Yes, I know. Yeah, it's like the the previous story was a good final story mm-hmm. for him, and this one, yeah, like you say, it doesn't really add anything to that. It doesn't even add much to the first Doctor. If, if anything, it takes things away. Mm-hmm. And I, in terms of the first Doctor, I, I say I think the scene that I really like is when he's explaining the whole thing about um, what he was trying to find out about the universe and good versus evil. Now, as you say, arguably it doesn't really add much uh, to the first Doctor, but I think it's a nice scene and it it does sort of sum up the first Doctor in many respects. And like what I said before, I think you could slot that explanation into the William Hartnell era and it would fit. Um, so that I quite like, but yeah, it, I, f- I find this a bit of a funny one. The the things that I really like, as I said, are the elements to do with the Captain of the First World War, which are really uh, things not really involving the Doctor. No, not at all. So it could have keyed in on that a bit more, couldn't it? Yeah, um, so it's a bit of a funny one. Because we, we tend to do this thing. I don't know what ranking you would give it, but I think for those reasons, I would probably, out of ten, I would give this five and a half. I don't know whether that's too harsh or not, but that's how I feel at the Possibly. moment. Possibly. Yeah. Um, I want, the way I look at it, when I was going to rank it, I start off at ten because just for pure e- for pure effort. And um, mm. I probably went into it with the best intentions. Oh yes, and yeah, yeah, without a doubt. It, and it sounds like pure fan fiction. Getting the first Doctor back, getting someone to reca- replay him. Mm-hmm. But then again, it does betray everything you thought <laughs> the first Doctor stood for. Mm-hmm. So that does mark it down quite a few marks. So um, I ended up on a seven out of ten. Oh, right, and, okay. I, and I thought that was being quite generous. All oh, right, okay, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that I can see why if 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 there are people listening who genuinely like this episode, um, I, you know, fair enough, and think that the five and a half is probably too harsh. I could see probably why people may think that, but at the same time, that's the ranking I feel comfortable with at the moment. Um, just as an aside, because I mentioned it before, uh, Paul Cornell has written the target novelization of it. If you are someone who likes the story um, I think it's definitely worth a read because Paul Cornell is a good writer and I like his prose style and this novelisation um, certainly contains that and there's some nice touches which we mentioned before there's a, there's a bit of a funny thing where it, he mentions how the captain when he's first in the TARDIS he ends up finding a VHS tape um, that's of the Daleks master plan According to Paul Cornell. All right. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, if, on the other hand, you're someone like me who, for all intents and purposes, is a bit indifferent to this story, I wouldn't recommend bothering getting the book because, despite 
Paul Kemmel's nice touches and pro style, you are just getting the same story. And if you have a problem with the story, like I do, you're just getting the same thing again. Um, so just if you were interested and in maybe thinking of getting it, if you like the story, get it. If you don't, it's it, the Togga novelisation is really not worth bothering with. Oh, okay. And does it feel like quite a quick read as well? Are they quite short novelizations? Oh yes, I mean he's uh, Paul Cornell has has uh, because it's only 161 pages, which is you know um, basically what the original target novelizations were were aiming for on the word length. Um, so yeah, it, it is a quick read. Yeah, so it's nice to go and revisit the story, but and it'll not take up too much time. Yeah, yeah, that's quite good. So Jody would get seen. Do you mm-hmm. think it was good, bad, predictable? Could have been better. Too much um, action. I don't know. What do you no, think? I mean, uh, my reaction to it when it was originally broadcast uh, was I really liked it. Uh, as I say, the regeneration itself I thought was was quite good, and the realization of when you're seeing Jodie uh, Jodie Whittaker there and seeing her reflection in the screen and the whole action, um, I thought it was it, it was a good way of of going right. This is the new Doctor. It's um, she seems you know she seems quite happy. Oh, brilliant! I mean, it's only two words, but. I thought it was actually quite a good introduction to her Doctor. And there is that action element which makes you want to tune in to when the series would come back. And I still think it works. I think it's good. The bit that I don't like is when, when it ends and it goes, to be continued, and you go, well, yeah. Ob- obviously. You'd hope so. <laughs> yeah, you would hope so. <laughs> it's um, not the final end. No. Um, but uh, other than that... Uh, it's a bit patronising. But other than that, uh, yeah, I really liked it. How about you? Uh, I really liked it. I thought it was very predictable. I don't know. I, I'd like something that's radically different sometime. Possibly like um... yes, I see what you mean. I think because at this point we had, I, I, I still think it was it was handled well and it was exciting yeah. and I liked it. But just in terms of the show, yeah, I think at this point we have seen it a few times when the Doctor has regenerated in the side of the TARDIS and it's caused major problems. I mean, in fact. It, in some ways, you could actually argue that this regeneration is, va- is pretty much what you get when Matt Smith was introduced. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I really like about the classic series when it comes to regenerations is each one is different. Yes. Uh, so it's it's exciting in of itself. You know, it, well, it's sad and it's exciting. You know, the Doctor's leaving and new ones introdu- being introduced, but you've also got this thing of what's the regeneration going to look like? They're all different. That's one element that I would like. I don't think they will, but it's one element that I wish the new series would bring back, that when the Doctor regenerates, it's not only you're seeing a new Doctor, but it's a new way of doing it, that the regeneration is different. Yeah, my only... um, What I was meaning was, it would be nice to have an an end scene where that gets people talking, you know? Something Mm. that pulls you into the drama, and you know it's going somewhere. Or it was a really good piece of writing for, like, one minute. I don't know. But yeah, it's just very predictable. But yes, mm-hmm. you're right. You can compare it to some of the others. Um, which of the Doctors have not regenerated in the TARDIS? Just... Uh, t- uh, John Pert, we didn't. Um, you... Well, he collapses outside. Oh, right. Okay, fair enough. I'll give it that. Uh, Tom Baker doesn't. Oh, yes, of course. Um, why did I just skip Tom Baker in my mind? Okay, Tom Baker... Sylvester McCoy doesn't. Well, no. uh, I mean, when he regenerates into Paul McGann. Yeah, Paul McGann doesn't. He regenerates on Khan. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that's it, that's it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Huh. How do you feel about the um, TARDIS interior getting destroyed? Were you sad, sad to see it go or happy to see it leave? It's a bit funny with that TARDIS design. At the time, I was never really um, particularly keen on it. I didn't, not to say I didn't massively dislike it. I just thought it was a bit cold. Yeah. Um, with all all the metal. But as time's gone on, funnily enough, um, I have warmed to it a bit more. But no, I, I, at, the, at the point that it was originally broadcast, um, I was looking forward to seeing a new TARDIS interior. And I love yeah. the new one. I think it's, you know, great. Love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, how about you? Now that I was revisiting this story, I realised how much I missed it. It did look cold to begin with, and then they tried to make it a bit more busy with the bootcases. Yes, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure how I felt about that at first, but it felt natural eventually. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think it, yeah, it was a TARDIS design that took me a little while to to like, and fun, funnily enough, I like it now that it's. <laughs> I think now that's not really in the show, which is a bit funny. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why it was not to say it was a bad design. I just it, I just felt it was a bit cold looking. Yeah. And of course, when it spoke to the Twelfth Doctor before he died, mm-hmm. when it was like, "Oh, go on, just die." <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, go on, and one more won't hurt. Yeah. Be nice if we nice if we'd had more of that. Mm-hmm. I feel like we don't really have a um, much of a center console now that could um, feel very um, animated. Mm. Mm. I don't know. We haven't seen much of the TARDIS as a character in the latest series, have we? No, and it's funny. It's sort of it's 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 one of those things which is hinted at in the classic series on occasion. Mm. They pick up on it a bit more in the new series because I think it is a good idea. But yeah, um, yeah, it is very rarely done. So yeah, one thing I was sad about revisiting this, I was hoping I'd um, go back to it, looking at it more in depth and justify the stuff with the first Doctor. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's um, that's everything about Twice Upon a Time. Yep. Um, if anyone would like to get in contact with us, um, just with, with their own views, whether you agree with us or disagree, whether you're uh, particularly if you like it, I think be because really my my thoughts on the episode haven't changed so uh, haven't really changed since it was originally broadcast. So if there's anyone who genuinely likes the episode, I think it'd be quite interesting to see um, your point of view. So please get in contact with us uh, in the usual places. Um, Facebook, you can find us at at facebook.com forward slash cloisterbell. We're on Twitter at podcast bell, Instagram, cloister underscore bell. In terms of listening to the podcast, um, we're on iTunes and SoundCloud and websites cloisterbell.co.uk. Uh, for the next podcast, we will be looking at the relatively uh, recent Doctor Who book publication, Scratchman.